Hey there, I'm Scott, and this is Tangents. Well, it is the 18th of August, 2022, as I'm recording this. Um, my guess is it's probably not even going to come out till September, but who knows? I just put out one from 10 days ago, so it seemed to be lagging by a little, mo little over a week. Um, it's Thursday night, tomorrow's Friday. I was going to fly tonight. And uh, there is actually a decent monsoon season this year, so uh, pretty much not happening most nights. Uh, going to end up doing it Sunday morning, so I think weather should work there. Uh, I really en I enjoy thunderstorms and all of this. It is a little annoying, well, in a, in a few different ways. Like, I'm doing IFR, so it's nice to... The idea of flying in actual instrument meteorological conditions, IMC, is appealing. But you wouldn't want to fly in like a thunderstorm. Yeah. Certainly, certainly not in a little plane and uh, really probably in general. And so, you know, it's like, when could I ever do that here? I don't know. I'm, I'm sure I'll find some occasion for it, but it seems like something there. It seems like if you're living someplace like on the coast where there's a marine layer regularly or something like that, probably good. If you're someplace where there's just kind of overcast and, you know, but if you're someplace like here where it's either VFR or, uh, you know, just like beautiful blue skies, annoyingly because it's like excessive, um, but you know, it's like that, or it's thunderstorms, in which case you probably don't want to fly in it <clears throat> for the most part. I mean, there, there are occasionally rare exceptions to that, but that's, um, hopefully my instrument training is converging. I, I feel like I'm making progress at least. This is going to be my first time, uh, on an actual instrument flight plan. So up till now, all the comms have been simulated just with my instructor handling the, handling the actual radio and then me talking to him as though I was talking to uh, ATC. So I think that's a good sign. I'm going to fly into Tucson, which yeah, is going to be a little bit of a bigger airport. I, I have landed there before, actually, in my private pilot training. So it's not my first time, but it's definitely, I think it might be my second time or... Uh, at most third. It's kind of cool. It's, you know, tiny matriculation. I do really want to converge on that though, because I'm, uh, several reasons, but it, it seems like it's kind of dragging on. It seems like, um, well, I'm very much thinking about moving. If I move and I haven't completed my instrument training, then I probably either don't or I have to start over. So I'd like to get my IFR rating before then. I have started a little bit of work on uh, a port of commercial rating, which would be what I get after that. Not because I want to fly commercially, um, but just to have the rating and kind of continue. I feel like uh, with aviation, um, unless you have an obscene amount of money and time, you're pretty much always learning. You're always growing and developing. And so I've got, I've got a ways to go there. So anyway, the thing I wanted to talk about today is hate. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is somebody, uh, somebody on Twitter mentioned me and said, you know, a bunch of leftists hate this one guy. Um, dude is just some random, relatively well-followed guy with a podcast, uh, ostensibly on the left, but really, I mean, his Twitter bio has an American flag in it, and he's pretty much one of a shockingly large number of people who are on the left, in giant air quotes, but really support MAGA kind of people, and they're kind of mysteriously, like, you know, they're, they're okay with right-wingers, much more than okay. Um, seems to me like, I, I, like, I don't know. I think part of it is just in terms of marketing. Um, yeah, if, if, I was, if I was making this to build an audience, 
then almost certainly what I would do is look at the episodes where I've gotten some traction. And if you look at the viewership on these, I don't know if that's public, but I can see it. Um, I do know that it's undercounting, but I can still see it. And I'm sure like within order of magnitude, it's right. But the ones that have performed the best uh, have been things like talking about Katie Hobbs. That one got a shocking amount of traction. Um, and it was, it was shorter, which helped. It was a political thing. People probably were searching for her and found it. Um, I, I talked about insults, and that got a decent amount of traction, I think, from insults. Uh, not the audience that I'd want to build, but, you know, get some traction there. And you look at that kind of stuff, and you'd, you'd probably go, okay, well, these things work. These things don't. And if I was optimizing to try to build an audience, I would start working at, like, steer into the things that work and steer away from the things that don't. And then the next thing you know, you start steering and you sort of realize, oh, well, this kind of thing doesn't get as much traction as that kind of thing. And at a certain point, it's like, well, uh, right wing sort of extremism plays a lot better gets a lot more traction, it gets a lot more views, you know, than whatever this is, you know? And, uh, I mean, to be fair, like, I could just, like, do some snappy editing and, you know, like, get some more, get myself hyped up and, like, try to make this something that I don't want to make. But, yeah, you know, why? Why? I'm, I'm extremely, I have to say, I think about this all the time when I'm watching YouTube videos, especially when people do like live reads in the middle of them, it's like, you know, I, I understand and appreciate that you have to, you know, you're on the fucking hamster wheel there, right? You have to churn out content. Uh, you have to get the advertisers. I'm so glad and very fortunate that I can just sit here and record myself doing these things and have not a great deal of free time, but enough free time to like do the editing, put it up and um, not have to do it for anybody. I'm just doing it for myself. Um, I, I look at people who have large followerships and you know, you start seeing things like they do extreme stuff. Obviously they're trying to, uh, to get more traction. You see uh, fact boy, um, Simon Whistler, he's got, I don't even know how many fucking uh, channels and he keeps making more. And I, I love his stuff. There's something, there's something about listening to him. The, the English accent helps, but there's something about his, uh, his sense of humor. He's reasonably well informed, although not, not amazingly so. Uh, he's got a decent kind of intuition and uh, sense of judgment and this kind of thing. And, you know, he's talking about stuff and it's just interesting and compelling. And I find myself just endlessly listening to it. But he's got the live reads in there. And, I mean, obviously he's got a fuck ton of people watching his shit. He'd kind of be stupid not to, uh, not to make money doing it. He's got a team of people writing for him and doing the editing and all that kind of stuff. You gotta, you gotta pay for that somehow. Um, it's a different world if you don't have to. It's, it's, it's such a, a sick thing. I, I mean, and I'm not criticizing the people that are successful about this. It's awesome for them. Um, it's, you know, knock yourselves out. It's great. But it's very depressing to me that uh, we live in a world where any kind of hobby, anything that you do for fun has to be commodified. You know, and even if you're not good at it, you just have to find a way to, you know, rise and grind and all this kind of bullshit. It's just not, it's so dumb, first of all. It's not productive. It's not, it's not adding to the world. It's not, you know, extending, you're, you're not making art. You're making a product to sell, for example. And to me, I mean, you know, make art for the sake of art. Now, it's great if you have an audience. Hopefully people will look at your paintings or they'll look at uh, your sculptures or they'll listen to your music uh, or watch your video podcast thing. But 
that's not why you should be doing it. And I, I think it's just the way that the world is constructed that you feel the need to turn everything into a gig. Everything has to be uh, some, something that generates revenue. It's the same thing with fucking education. You know, it's not good enough to get a bunch of degrees and learn a ton of shit and just be knowledgeable and be able to share that knowledge. You have to find ROI. You have to like, you're putting in money, you're putting in time and you have to get a certain number of tokens out of the machine. Otherwise it wasn't worth it. You wasted your time. You wasted, I hear people say this all the time. Like, Oh, my undergrad was my, I, I'm so grateful for all the education I've had. I would love to get more. Uh, someday I, I probably will. But I, I look at that and just the fact that it's not irrational for people to say, you know, like, oh, they, it sucked because they ended up spending a shit ton of money and you shouldn't have to. Education should be free. Maybe if you go to some private school and you know, then, okay, it's you charge for it. Yeah. But education up to a very advanced level, uh, graduate school, getting a PhD, getting a MD, getting a JD, all of that kind of stuff should be free. And it should be free partially because it's an investment in the future, not necessarily in terms of you in particular, but if you learn more, you're going to make better decisions when you're voting. This is a thing that, you know, I mean, you're going to make better decisions when you're buying shit. You're going to make better decisions in your life. You're more informed. You have a richer, fuller, happier life. Now, I do think that happiness is, um, I see a lot of people like, you know, oh, what do you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be happy. And I don't have a problem. Like, it's great to be happy, but that shouldn't be the goal. It's like an incidental thing. It's like, it's great to make money doing something, but that shouldn't be the goal. That shouldn't be the thing that's driving you. It should be sort of a, a side thing, a side benefit. Like you, you make beautiful art and now people start paying you. But if, if they weren't paying you, you should still be able to make that art and you should be able to live comfortably. You should be able to have a, you know, I, okay, maybe you don't have a mansion. Maybe you don't have a private jet. Maybe you don't have, you know, a beach house and a cabin uh, to go skiing and all this kind of stuff, but you should have a decent residence and, you know, like a comfortable space. We can totally afford that. Um, you should have good food. Like maybe you're not getting the gold leaf covered um, Wagyu steak or whatever the fuck, but you're getting good food. You're getting you know, health, whatever you want within reason. And I include in that, like if you want a bottle of wine, by all means, maybe you're not getting the $1,500 bottle of wine, but if you want that, sure. If you want to smoke weed, that should be free, uh, within reason, of course, but you know, you're not getting like mountains of stuff, but there's a certain amount of stuff that just in life, and, and I don't just mean necessities, the things that you enjoy should either be very cheap or free up to the point of excess. Like there's obviously like, if you want to build uh, a super tanker, something huge, something massive. Okay. Then you start having to pay for it. But when you're talking about, you know, just like public transportation, this is a thing that drives me nuts. Um, many, many things do, but if you look at uh, places where they have subways, for example, or just public transit in general, often the amount of tax, tax money that goes into funding that stuff covers something like 90%. And then you have this neoliberal bullshit that people are like, oh, well, we have to run it as a business to kind of partially recoup costs. And I got in an argument with somebody because they're like, oh, that's not, that's not running it as a business if you're partially recouping. It's like, yeah, you're running, a literally is running it like it's a business that is subsidized. That's not how fucking government services and public goods should work. That's not, I don't pay part, I don't pay 10% of the street to go out on the street or the sidewalk. I don't pay 10% of that. I can just walk on the fucking street if I want to. You should be able to have high-speed internet access, which we developed with taxpayer money. 
for free. You should have insulin if you need it for free. It shouldn't be under $35 if you have an insurance plan and if this, and yeah, we're actually going to give the insurance company and the drug company much more money and you're only paying $35 out of pocket uh, because we have to find ways to shovel tax money, public funds into these private companies. No, fuck that shit. It should be fucking free. If somebody's going to die or go blind or lose their fingers um, because they didn't get a drug that we have that we can make, thanks to government-funded research, we can make it, I mean, I, I want to say as cheaply as beer, but realistically, probably cheaper. It's something that um, we, we developed transgenic expression in, um, in yeast and all of this kind of stuff. We developed the ability to, exp or to take a gene from a human and put it in there and express it and isolate it and purify it and uh, package it and deliver it. We developed the understanding of what insulin is and how it works and how to dose it and all of this stuff. Almost all of that stuff, publicly funded. We paid for that shit. And I'm happy to pay for it, as should you be. Now, one thing I'm not happy to pay for is $850 billion a year in garbage that partially is defense and partially you know, under, the, under the banner of defense, but it largely is just like fucking corporate welfare to companies that are making weapons and doing other bullshit. That I'm not happy to pay for. Fuck that shit. That we shouldn't be paying. Yeah, I, I understand the Constitution does say um, for the common defense, but it doesn't mean giving companies just billions and billions and billions of dollars a year. It means do enough to make sure that we're not going to get fucked over. It's, it's frustrating. Yeah. You look at how much money we spend on cops. It, if, if the U.S. police forces by the amount that we spend, would be the third largest military in the world. They'd be the third largest military in the world behind two countries. One of those countries is China, and the other one is one that you might not have heard of called the United States. We have the largest military, and then we have the third largest paramilitary, and we're spending so much fucking money on these things. We could, we could cut the military in a third and still be spending more than China. And China's population compared to ours, I mean, and you look at the land area and all of this, it just doesn't make any fucking sense. It's stupid. And then you look at China is building this national high-speed rail network. We can't even fucking think about that here. It's so ridiculous. It's so, like, I, I, it makes me apoplectic. And getting back to the, to the subject for tonight, not that you're going to be watching it at night, but you know, for my little, my little sermon here, uh, the subject of hate, I, I brought this up because somebody said, you know, like, oh, well, a lot of leftists hate this guy. I don't, I don't really think that I hate anybody, honestly. And I'm not saying that because I think I'm such a good person. Oh, I'm, I'm too good to hate people. I'm like, oh, I, I look down my nose at the people who hate. No, it's not even that. It's just, I'm too goddamn lazy. Like, the amount of energy it takes to hate somebody, it's, it's a ridiculous amount. Why would you do that? Somebody you dislike, you're going to invest that much energy and time and effort into? Huh. Indifference. They do say, like, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. I, I'm fine to be indifferent toward people. I'm fine to be, like, you know, I don't like that person. I'm fine to say, like, yeah, this person or Jimmy Dory or Dor, however the fuck you pronounce his name. Um, and the thing is, honestly, like, I don't even, it's not even that I dislike him necessarily. It's I feel sorry for the motherfucker. You know, as far as I can tell, he's like a, essentially an alcoholic whose whole shtick is just like pulling up uh, tweets and then putting up screenshots of those tweets and then ranting about them. And he's supposed to be a comedian, but there's less humor in his shit that what granted I've not seen that much but from what I've seen less humor in his shit than mine and I'm not trying to be funny here uh, and and certainly I don't claim would never claim that this is comedy would never claim that this is you know like I'm, I'm fucking making you bust a gut 
it's just sad. It's sad. And then you look at these people and they put this shit out there and it's not just that they're spreading bullshit and, you know, taking advantage of people, which they are doing. And it's not just that they realized, oh, I can get traction doing this. I can get views. I can make money, you know, do all of this kind of shit because they've got this sort of stuff. They're doing active harm. You know, they're undermining. I mean, I mean, you know, I certainly don't have pure positive good things to say about like AOC or Omar or uh, Rashad. Rashad. Um, yeah, the, the, the squad. I like them a lot. Some things that I would criticize them for. Although I do think a lot of those things that I would criticize them for, it's kind of like uh, Obama. If Obama was the person who I wish he would have been, probably never would have gotten to the presidency and certainly wouldn't have been the first. Yeah, it's, it's a problem. Um, there's this, and also like, you know, Clinton, Hillary, Bill is a different issue. Not a fan of Bill's at all. Hillary, I, it's not even that I, you know, I'm, not, I'm certainly not a fan. I don't hate her. I, I feel sorry for her. I do understand, like, in the 90s, she came out with her healthcare thing, got up in front of Congress, did this stuff, and then there, all the Republicans are like, fuck that shit, we're gonna completely rat fuck you, and uh, deride you, and all this stuff. And, I, you know, I feel bad for her. Although I also look at her career path, and then you kind of think, well, and, and you understand, like, part of the reason that people become the way they do is because they're responding to what gets traction. You know, you, it's that Jenga thing that I talk about a lot. It has a dark side. It really does. You push that uh, block and you find out it just wants to move and that's not a good block to be pushing. A lot of people will just keep pushing that block. You start doing something, you start spewing hate and you find out, oh, I'm getting a lot of people liking it. You know, like Carrie Lake. Carrie Lake running for governor here, uh, says horrible, hateful things. And not by any means unique. Now, does she believe the shit that she says? Or is she doing a performance which happens to get a lot of traction and she's just completely amoral? Fundamentally, it doesn't matter. It just does not matter. You know, if you're just doing a performance and you actually don't have a drop of hate in you, but you're spreading it and you're making people angry and you're making people hate each other, you're still doing that. Ultimately, that's what matters. So this does not in any way absolve her, but I kind of wonder, like, is she really as horrible as she seems to be? Or is she just completely amoral? Like, I don't think Jimmy Dore is, um, however you say his name, I don't think that he is like a horrible person. I just think he sort of found a thing that works and just kept going on it, kept pushing that Jenga block. And similarly with her, I think a lot of the, you know, the Republican parties in the States, they're crazy. They're off the fucking, you know, out of the fucking world, uh, out of any kind of contact with reality. Do they do that because they really believe it? Or do they do it because it worked for Trump and they have a way, you know, like it's just, this is a thing that we found that works. And so we're going to just double down on it. We're just going to keep going. Okay. And I, I don't know. I don't really care. I do hope that it's the latter, that they're just, you know, it's not that they're as evil as they appear. Although in, in some sense, isn't that worse? Because at least if you're like a really genuinely malignant, hateful, racist, horrible person. Um, at least then you're being, you know, you're doing those things, but you believe that shit. If you're just an amoral motherfucker who does not give a shit and you do that stuff and you're causing real harm and you're putting poison into the world, not because you believe it, but because it works for you. I don't know. I think that's actually kind of worse. Yeah. It, it just, it's, it's sad. It's really fucking sad. And the thing is, how do you get back from where we are? I don't know. The, the thing about hate also, like in addition to just taking so much energy, is I, I do feel like it's something which is a bit of a matter of habit. 
Like, go. Uh, I, I think, I mean, so much of how we respond to the world seems to be a combination, and, and I'm by no means an expert in this domain, so I'm kind of talking out of my ass, but this is my, obs it's my observation based on a tiny bit of knowledge. I think we have a certain amount of sort of temperament, like intrinsic, um, you know, just kind of how you are, how you respond to stuff. Are you someone who's prone to anxiety? Are you someone who is calm? Are you someone who takes chances? Are you someone who is more reserved? To some extent, I think that's hardwired. And then, or at least I think you have like a norm that's hardwired. And then you have a distribution around that norm. And the spread of the distribution, probably also hardwired. The shape, I'm, I'm drawing it like it's kind of a quasi-Gaussian. It could be some other distribution. It could be multimodal or whatever, but you know, it's kind of, I think that's hardwired. But within that structure, within that framework, within that innate aspect of you, you can develop things. You can become calmer. You can become more you know, wild and temperamental. You can make yourself um, become an exerciser. You can go from not being a runner to being a runner to being an ultra marathoner. I have a friend and he's an ultra marathoner and he wasn't always. And I always think about that because I, I can't stand running. And I always, I sort of envy people who run because I could, in principle, you could take your running shoes anywhere in the world. And now granted, you have to take a shower afterwards and all this, but you could run through Paris. You could run through Shanghai or Melbourne or Tampa or wherever the fuck you happen to be. If I want to go bicycling there, um, I have to bring my bike or I have to rent a bike. And if you rent a bike, are you renting a good bike or are you renting a shitty? Yeah, you know, it's hard. It's not the same thing. Um, it, it, I'm envious of that. And I think about like this guy up to the point, and I don't think he was even that young. I think he might have been late 20s, early 30s. And he just decided, okay, I'm just going to start running. And he started running and started running and started running. And uh, a year or two later, he's running ultra marathons. And now, I mean, he's like out of shape, in air quotes. I think he's getting back. Uh, but he's relatively in worse shape than he used to be. But he can still, if he wanted to, just like put his shoes on, run a marathon, and yeah, no big deal. So there's certain aspects of of us that are that are very mutable uh, within within the framework that we're given. And I do think hate is one of those things where you can just you can develop a sort of habit of how you respond to things. Do you respond by being annoyed? Do you respond by hating? Do you respond by aggression? Or do you respond by getting introverted? Do you, um, when you're attacked, do you, do you duck or do you fight? I, that kind of thing can be trained. And it's also something that you train yourself. It's something that every day, when you find yourself in some situation or another, you respond to it in a certain way. And when you respond to it, you're not just responding in that moment, you're training yourself to respond in that way. And the next time you find yourself in the same situation or a similar one, you're more likely to respond in that way. Uh, it's one of these things that I learned. I mean, you know, I talk about how shy I used to be. Still, when it comes to dating and certain other areas, but especially dating, I'm extremely uncomfortable there. I like If I was gonna ask somebody out, which I have done in my life, but if I'm going to ask somebody out, it is unnerving. It's very stressful for me. Um, very difficult. Especially, like, if I'm really into her, then that's, that's a much harder thing than if it's kind of, like, uh, you know, relatively indifferent. And even then, but it's, it's one of these things where probably, I would assume, if I would train myself to just keep doing it, uh, at a certain point, I would be more comfortable with it. Because... Similarly, like I used to be so uncomfortable getting up in front of a classroom and now I can do it. Now I can record myself doing this shit and I'm, I'm pretty fine with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, I'm weirdly okay uh, recording this and putting it out there. Now, granted, if more people were watching it and people were talking to me about it, maybe I'd be less so. 
But I do have, you know, like my mom might watch this. Gil will certainly listen to it and we'll probably talk about it. So it's not like people are not listening. And in some sense, those are probably weirder and harder than abstract random people that you don't know. Um, although sometimes a random person that you don't know starts watching your YouTube videos and then follows you on Twitter and then becomes kind of like a, uh, a Twitter friend. It's, it's a funny thing that, uh, that happens. But I do think like, it, and it's not just, it's not just a deliberate choice to hate or not to hate. Um, but I do think it's something that you can train. I do think that it's something that you can develop. If you want to cultivate hate, you can. And part of cultivating hate would involve things like, um, you know, drone strike on your family. You know, you're at a wedding and the evil empire has a drone operated from the other side of the world. No one's even at risk. And all of a sudden, boom, you know, your brother's dead. Your parents might be dead. And now, you, know, you probably don't like the person who sent that missile to you. And, you know, now are you going to hate them or not? Certainly, you know, there are different ways to go. You could just be compassionate, although, you know, that's a really tall ask. Or you can probably hate them pretty easily. And you start talking to other people and you get encouraged to go one way or another. Um, you get, I mean, this is a thing... Like with modeling, uh, there's a lot of how we are that comes from just reproducing models that other people have shown us. Whether they're our parents or people in the media, you know, who knows? Whatever it is, you've seen it, and the way other people responded to that circumstance, to that situation, kind of teaches you how to do it. Just, just like I have all of these words that I'm saying, and I put them together in certain orders. And a lot of those orders are not like me originally recombining them. It's me taking fragments from things that other people have said and dropping them in. It's, it's an interesting and kind of weird thing actually, but when I was, when I was first learning uh, French, especially, but in any language, you do these scenarios. And in the scenarios, you're like, bonjour, bonjour, comment, Comment ça va? Ah, ça va bien. Et toi? Ah, ça va. Ah, quelle heure est-il? And you, you start doing these things. And I used to think the, the scenarios were just weird and silly and all of this. At a certain point, I realized, and I don't know why I didn't realize this before, because it's obvious, but I realized uh, those scenarios are priming you with little fragments that you can use in conversation. I think this is kind of one of the ways that we build language. It's not that we're necessarily learning all of the structure of English and reproducing it, although we do have that. It's certainly a capability. But to some extent, hey, what's happening? You just learn the phrase. You learn in this context, this is what you say, and you repeat it. it it's, it's not very... It's one of these things which is... Uh, I don't know. It, I don't want to dismiss our intelligence or capacity, but there are certain things that we do where when you kind of peek behind the curtain a little bit, it, it's not the most impressive thing in the world, let's just say. Which is not to say that we can't, we're not capable of much more, but there's a lot of stuff that we do, especially when we're on autopilot, you don't think about, um, hey, have a nice flight, you too and it's to the gate agent who's not going anywhere. You just, you know, it, it, it's not that we're exactly automata that are reproducing stuff randomly, but you can do a remarkable job of simulating us with that kind of thing. Um, but one of the best accounts on Twitter is at infinite underscore scream. And the thing about this account is it's a bot and all it does is tweets out, ah, at different lengths of A's and H's. Um, and then if you tweet at it, it tweets a scream back at you. And the thing that I find extraordinary about it is like, I don't think there's any machine learning or intelligence or probably not even like a statistical model in there. 
there other than just randomly pick string lengths. And yet that thing feels like a presence. It feels like it has a personality. Your brain looks at that and you're so keyed up to like recognize that in something else that you see it even though it's not there. And it's interesting to me. I find that very, uh, I find it fascinating. So anyway, I'm, uh, I think that's probably all I want to say. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a hateful person. I don't really have a lot to say about hate other than if you find yourself doing it, you know, I don't know. It, it's fine. Don't beat yourself up, but there are other ways to be, you know, it's just like, why? And I don't think, I don't think it's a productive thing. Generally speaking, I, I don't think it leads to good places, which is not to say that you should pare down your emotions and have like a limited set of experiences. But it is one thing where you're like, well, I don't know, probably, probably not the best thing. And especially if something happens and uh, you have an innate response, should that innate response be to hate whatever that was, or should it be to try to understand it or sometimes just understand like shit happens? You know, there's, there's, I, I find a lot of, I, I say this a lot, but I find a lot of comfort in not being religious, not being raised with religion. And one of the things that really helps me, and I, it's one of these things that's like the only reason I know that this is even a thing to feel good about is that I see other people talking about how bothered they are by the alternative, but they're raised to believe that, you know, either everything happens for a reason or you have some kind of an omnipotent God who deliberately planned stuff and, you know, like things are going on in a certain way and then they'll, they like, you know, start hating God. You know, hate a fictional character. Because, and, and you can understand why, because if you have that belief, you, if you sit there and like you're constructing the world in a way that every kind of random coincidence is divine intent uh, made manifest, then when lots of shitty things happen, lots of horrible things happen, and you start thinking like, well, yeah, and then you start, this is where also you start layering on, well, obviously God is good and omnipotent, but we're, you know, wants to give you free will. And it, it, it's amazing how many epicycles people add to try to just not let go of that one original kind of like wacky belief. But yeah, I, I get, I get to some extent why people become hateful and it, you know, why you get the angry atheist archetype. It's, it's one of these things also like, um, I, I'm, I'm definitely not that it's one of the reasons why I, I do go with non-religious rather than atheist, because I think Aside from the fact that I don't think the concept of religion makes any damn sense, um, you know, atheists without God um, or absence of God, well, the concept of God doesn't make sense. So without that is like, you know, you're a unicornist. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, I guess technically maybe you could define it, but it's just like, it's an imaginary thing. Why would you, and it's not, it's very different from being agnostic. I, I think that's important to, to say because agnostic means you don't know. Atheist means you know that there is none. And non-religious just means that it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't mean anything. They're nonsense. And um, yeah, you know, they're just the fundamental concepts that people are talking about there just don't even make sense. They're just weird, random words that and ideas that people have used to superstitiously try to explain random events. They see that infinite scream and they're like, that's, there's a person there that's just laughing at me or yelling at me or fucking up my life or making my life, you know, better, whatever, whatever it is. And, you know, like, well, I know that uh, I'm not doing anything more than other people and I'm really successful or I'm really failing. And so you're like, oh, God really likes me or God really doesn't like me. And you start coming up with these weird attributions to things that are just random chance, or maybe they're not just random chance. Maybe you're successful because you, in part, you, know, you were lucky, but also you worked hard and you had good insights 
or maybe you're not successful because you did those things, but you, shit happens, yeah? Or any combination thereof. It's, it's different than thinking like there's someone behind the curtain pulling the strings, you know? So with that, thank you as always. Um, say Jen.